Hello, tech fans, and welcome aboard to the latest Tech Sideline podcast, originating from TSL's high tech studios in the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Whether you're watching or listening, whether you're with us live or archived, we're so glad that you could join us today as we record on Wednesday, September 4th, and get you set for game two of the Virginia Tech football season as the Hokies take on the Old Dominion Monarchs in the 2019 home opener at Lane Stadium. We've got Malcolm, yes, he's related, Stuart behind the scenes producing today's podcast on the set. Our managing editor to my left, Chris Coleman. Across the way, the head honcho, the founder, Will Stewart. And I'm your podcast host, Evan Hughes. Gentlemen, week two of the year, it is upon us. How are you guys doing? Let me commend you on your, you're just, man, you're just dialed in. Your your <laughs> intros every week are right on. You're like, you've got it. Like if you're watching live, if you're if you're listening or watching archived, man, you're just you're just rolling. What time do you wake up? <laughs> I never go to sleep, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like you're a one p.m. mode. All the time. Like you're right in the middle of your day. You know, I always try and bring the same energy I have at eight in the morning to like eight p.m. at night. So uh, I appreciate that. I always like to give the open a you know a nice solid open. I hope everyone's having a great week. We are well done. We're man. glad you're with us. Uh, it's a uh, it's a big week. Hokies are back at home. Uh, it's gonna be. Great to you know have the Hokie Nation back at Lane Stadium. You guys looking forward to being back in Blacksburg, having football back this weekend? Yeah, for sure. Got friends coming into town. Should have a good tailgate. Awesome. Yeah, now, yeah, you, yeah, same here. Same here. I'll, I'll be over in that Center Street area because uh, Malcolm, yes, he's related, lives over on Warren Street, which is right off of Center Street. So, uh, you know, I, I know Malcolm's the producer, but at one point we need to sit him right there and get him to tell us about the, the student experience on game day. I've, I've done that Center Street Zoo and – and so if, you, and if you're a middle-aged dude like me and you want to be popular on Center Street, just carry a bottle of wine around. You will be popular. <laughs> it is uh, – I have seen it from afar. <laughs> it is – Center Street, it is a, uh, an, a wild experience from, from what I've heard. So. Yeah, it, I think we probably talked about this on the podcast last year. It made Athlon. You know, Athlon's preseason magazine, they did uh, – it was a feature on – best tailgating or, or, or pregame or whatever. And they, they mentioned center street and I actually didn't know about it until then. And so this was last summer before Malcolm moved over to Warren street. And I was just like, Oh, center street's a big deal. Nobody went over there when I was in school. And whoa, that, that place is insane. E- even the spring game, or I think a couple of away games, it is a, it is the place to go if you're a college student is what I've heard. So, yeah. So we need to, at some point, uh, we need, we need to get Malcolm on here and, and we need to have some video. We need to have some pictures and uh, just uh, because I did uh, when, when I tailgated one time on Center Street uh, last year. And this is why I talk about the bottle of wine. I've got this jacket. It looks like a letter jacket. It's not a real letter jacket. It's something we used to sell on TechLocker.com years ago. And uh, it, it looks like a Virginia Tech letter jacket, except the VT is small. It's not the big, huge VT that. Right. So I'm walking along in Center Street, and, and this, this young college student grabs me. She's like, is that a letter jacket? Did you play, you know, a sport at Tech? And she starts the conversation with that. Next thing I know, three of her friends are standing there. There's four of them, and I'm holding court, man. I'm like, yeah, I got game, you know? And then one of them says, can I have a sip of your wine? And I was like, okay, this is what it's about. And let me tell you something. When that wine bottle was empty, the girls moved on. So... <laughs> Oh, uh, well, by the way, I didn't lie to him. I, I didn't lie to him and tell him. I you might have just sport. publicly uh, admitted to serving alcohol to, to uh, underage. No, I never said that. It was it was a girl at Center Street. Yeah. yeah. So, by the way, <laughs> since we're on the, the, the subject of Center Street, I talked to a uh, Montgomery County cop about this at, at, a, at a party a few months back. And, and he said, basically, uh, when the police are down there in that Center Street mob scene, they just want to make sure that everybody is safe. And nobody's, you know, they're not looking to bust underage kids. You know, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm giving away trade secrets for police here, but um, really that's, that's their, they're, they're not eyeballing every single kid trying to f- figure out who's, who's uh, of age and who's underage. They just want to make sure that people aren't getting in fights, that uh, nobody's drinking way too much and threatening their health and that sort of thing. So, so let me, let me interrupt that. All right, they, so, Mal- so Malcolm's interrupting. We'll share it with the podcast people here in a second. Go ahead. Yeah, so a lot of fraternities hold houses on Center Street, and they throw these huge parties all the time, whether it's a game day or not. So the poli- the chief of police or somebody high up sent out an email that if it's not a game day weekend, they will be 
shutting everything down. People are like going home in cuffs. It's this whole thing. Oh, bummer. So that's a new thing. Yeah. Ah. So too bad for the fraternities. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, just, just, just the instant you figure out a fun way to party, you know, the man's got to come down on you. Well, that's Center Street's just going to be one of many things going on this weekend as Virginia Tech plays their home opener against Old Dominion. And we're going to be breaking down the Monarchs and the Hokies, a preview right here on the Tech Sideline podcast. Again, recording on Wednesday, September the 4th at about 10 in the morning. Of course, each and every podcast is presented by the Fisher Law Firm, Virginia's trusted DUI and traffic defense firm, dedicated to defending individuals charged with traffic-related offenses. From their offices in Blacksburg and Roanoke, the Fisher Law Firm handles cases throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. To date, the firm has defended more than 30,000 people charged with moving violations. For a free consultation, call anytime, day or evening, toll free at 1-800-680-7031 or email them at info at fisherlegal.com. Quickly, before we dive in, Will, I know you have a podcast set update for our viewers and maybe for our listeners too, so they can make the transition over and maybe watch a podcast one week. Right. So uh, this is an ongoing process. We're evolving and improving on a weekly basis. And for those who watch the videos, uh, we've got some black side curtains on, or on order, should be here tomorrow thursday so we'll try to get those installed before the next show because currently if you watch on the video you you get a little bit of what's beside the set on each side so you get a window you get a wall and stuff like that so we'll have that uh hopefully screened off soon um and i'm i'm getting antsy to order more cameras and do multiple camera angles so like when i'm talking you can see my handsome face which is made for radio and when you guys are talking you can see your young actually handsome faces but that's, that's kind of the next big step for us is to set up cameras on each side and do some cuts. And we continue to work with improving the audio. Um, I think the audio for the podcast is generally pretty good. Uh, we're learning the video production we're learning as we go along. So, uh, you know, as always, give us feedback. You know, if you're on Facebook Live listening, watching, you know, let us know if, if one of us is low or high or, 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 or you know, volume wise. Uh, and if you're watching the video on YouTube later, archived, uh, give us feedback there on how it sounds and, uh, you know, any suggestions you have. So, uh, and you know, the one thing I haven't done that I need to do is I forgot, I want to install some under shelf lighting here to kind of, uh, illuminate the little knickknacks and stuff that we've got going on. So, uh, that's kind of the skinny on the, uh, set this week. It's exciting. It's ever improving every single podcast. The, uh, it's a lot of fun seeing the studio uh, come together. So, guys, let's dive right into it. Uh, before we get to the Old Dominion preview, we last recorded on Monday. We recap Boston College. The biggest news in between then is that running back Jalen Holston is going to be out for a while. That was Coach Justin Fuente's words at the press conference. Uh, Chris, I'll start with you. The running game was obviously a, a point of emphasis in the offseason. Holston was a guy who was getting a lot of love in the offseason. What does that mean for the running back room? Well, he finally had a healthy offseason. Um, I think quickness was his issue in the past, and it's a little bit ironic, I guess, that I thought he displayed a lot of quickness. He had a cut in the backfield and displayed some quickness that he hadn't displayed in the past. On the play, he got hurt, of wow. course. Yeah. That's... Um, you, you just hate to see that, you know, yeah. the, those guys that can just never get healthy. It, it, it gets discouraging for them. I was, uh, I was actually at a five-star nutrition the day before the game, and the guy in there knows Jalen, and uh, he was talking about how healthy Jalen felt for the first time in his tech career, yeah. and then that happened on his fourth carry. So, yeah, it's a shame, and you, you hope there's not a uh, trickle-down effect because, you know, let's face it, Deshaun McLeese is, is – never spent a, an entire season healthy at Virginia Tech. He's probably never spent an entire half season, or maybe not even entire, an entire month he healthy at Virginia Tech because he's just so small. Um, so that, that puts more of the load on him, who hasn't been able to stay healthy in the past, and true freshman Kishon King, King yep. who's 182 pounds. And, and still has a high school body. Right, yeah. right. Um, I mean, he, I mean the, the, he's still a kid, man. He's got braces. We talked about that on Monday, and uh, I guess Terrius Wheatley is Virginia Tech's third tailback now, and what is he, like 190 pounds on a six-foot frame? He, so so now Malik Bell comes into play, but Fuente did not mention He Bell didn't mention at him. the press conference um, the other day. And so Bell stood out in the spring game, for those that don't remember, yeah, from he had Louisa a good County, game. I believe. Um, Caleb Stewart is a guy who uh, could 
factor in redshirt and, and freshman. he did get mentioned in, the, in their press conference he, he, he did get mentioned uh the staff was kind of split on him when he was recruited as i understand uh I don't. I don't know. I wouldn't be all optimistic there if yeah. they had to play him. And of course, Cole Beck uh, had a collarbone injury before the season started, and he's not available. Mm-hmm. So uh, it seemed like Tech had a lot of bodies at running back before the season. Evan, how much eligibility you got? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me out there playing my running back. I promise you that. Um, and it seems like to Holston, in a way, Chris. Correct me if I'm wrong. Really tried. In the Stephen Peoples role, so to speak, he was more the power back in the room. Is that fair to say? If, well, yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody – by default, nobody else qualifies as, as a power back. Um, but, yeah, I mean, when two of your backs are 180 pounds or thereabouts, you know, you'd like to have a bigger back, obviously, because I don't think you can uh, split the carries between 280-pound backs, basically. And uh, that's what Tech is might have to do from here on out, depending on how much they, they trust the other guys like Stewart and, and, you know, even Wheatley small Wheatley was a guy who needed to stay healthy early in his career. So he could put on mass. Wheatley's Instead was a shoulder, right? Shoulder issues, had to have shoulder surgery, missed an entire off season of strength and conditioning. So he was not able to get bigger, faster and stronger. And a shoulder injury, as far as strength and conditioning goes, is worse than like a torn ACL because you can't do lower body workouts. You can't do upper body workouts. There's just not a whole lot you can do. Yeah. Um, whereas yeah. with an ACL, you know, at least you can do some upper body stuff and, and, and fill out and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's not a great situation right now. Uh, that being said, I, I felt the entire time that Kashawn King, whether Jalen Holston's on the roster or not, that Kashawn King is Virginia Tech's most talented running back. So we're, so we're sitting here talking about running backs, and, and you know the elephant in the room is that the, the run blocking needs to be better. Mm-hmm. And as we've discussed ad nauseum, the decision-making in the, in the read option needs to be better. So it's one thing to talk about the running backs, but it's quite another thing to present these running backs with running lanes and opportunities to gain yardage, which I didn't think happened against Boston College. It didn't, and and when you, t- I, I don't want to talk about Boston College too much because that was that was Monday's podcast, but right. uh, you know, Will is th- struggling against Boston College. Well, he struggled against BC last year too. He couldn't see the field against BC's defense, and and, and, uh, you, and you think that's because BC plays a lot of zone, and that's Willis's. Uh, I, well, they got him out of base defense on Saturday. If you listen to Fuente, yeah, yep. Um, but they were still more zone than man. Obviously, yeah. it's BC. Uh, and then so it's two years in a row where Willis has struggled against them. Two years in a row where. Tech couldn't run the ball against BC. But they did a good job running the ball against most teams last year. They just got down by 20 or 30 points, and you couldn't tell it. Stephen Peoples would have been a 1,000-yard rusher in a normal season for Tech. So it might just be a BC thing. Time will tell. Time will tell. Uh, we'll, we'll find out. Which um, segues into what, this. Well, I do wish Stephen Peoples was back, though. <clears throat> and it goes back to why was that guy – not red-shirted in 2015 just to be on the kickoff return right, team. Right. Always be red-shirting guys, man. You never know when you're going to need them. And, and you know, uh, and not that the transfer portal existed back then, right. but Peoples was a VT guy all the way. He wasn't, wasn't going to get all anywhere. grumpy and quit. G- right? Galax, Virginia, correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if they had red-shirted him, he, he wouldn't have complained. Well, he was a walk-on. Well, yeah. Of course sure. he's not going <laughs> to <laughs> So quickly recapping the running back room for this weekend against Old Dominion. Will it be more by committee, a rotation of guys? Will we see an increased workload for Kashawn King? How do you think they'll attack that? I think they'll add a third back to the mix. I'm not exactly sure who it will be. Oh, it's it'll be, be Wheatley yeah. or Stewart or, or what. Um, but, I, you know, I, it's one of those things. Like, I think I think Kashawn King is the best running back. So I do want him to get the most carries, but I don't, I don't want to overload the guy. You don't want to either. beat him up. Yeah. Right. I, no, I do think by the end of the season, he will be Virginia Tech's leading rusher. Uh, I, I think I, I kind of thought that might be the case before, but I de- <laughs> definitely really, lean that now way. You're now. really thinking. Yeah. That, yeah. You're listening to the Tech Sideline podcast recording on Wednesday, September 4th, 10 a.m., previewing Virginia Tech and Old Dominion as we transfer over now and transition into our preview part of the podcast will i had this question written down which was when you look back on that game a year ago the 49 35 win for old dominion one of the biggest wins and upsets in college football history and technicalities you actually went back and watched the game recently so watching it again a year removed 
what was different about watching it in 2019 to 2018 and what were some of the thoughts that were rekindled when you watched it? So I'm probably going to talk for a while here. Um, I watched it last night and speed watched it, skipped some of the breaks between plays after a while. Um, and it's, it's, it's really uh, morbidly fascinating to go watch that game. Um, Virginia Tech's season changed and the, and the discussion around Virginia Tech football changed that day. Going into that game, Justin Fuente was 21 and eight at Virginia Tech. I believe he's four and seven since then, I think is the, is the stat I read in the last 11 games or so. Um, the way people talk about Virginia Tech football started changing that day. You go back and you watch that game, and, and first of all, you know, up, up here on the television, here on the podcast set, we've got Trayvon Hill sitting on the bench as the game's winding down, looking depressed. And those are some of the last moments Trayvon Hill was sporting a Virginia Tech uniform. You saw the last moments of uh, Josh Jackson wearing a Virginia Tech uniform. Um, it, there, were, there were a lot of guys on the field, Josh Jackson, Trayvon Hill, Bryce Watts, uh, Dylan Rivers was in play, and Dylan's still with the team. He didn't play as much anymore. Just a, just a lot of guys involved. Devin Hunter played in that game. Remember Started. Devin struggled, struggled at the whip spot, I yeah. think, and got redshirted after that. I think the coaches said, based on what they saw in that game, hey, let, let's redshirt him. <clears throat> so that's just a lot of what goes through my mind. And we, we were talking about the running game and – you know, Virginia Tech's running game shredded ODU that day. Everybody talks about ODU having, you know, a, a, a million yards of offense and 49 points and all that. Virginia Tech had something like 600 yards of offense. 600 on the dot, I think. 318 rushing yards. Peoples, 156 yards. McLeese, 75. Josh Jackson, 58 yards. And Willis ran for 30. Yeah, and uh, – Josh Jackson was was tearing ODU up with the read option. He was mm -hmm. making great reads and getting out to the edge over and over. And that's how he broke his foot. And yeah, and it was working up until then. <laughs> and uh, Willis even had a nice play on a read option very early on, like probably his second play in the game. And and he got downfield and he almost scored. You could tell ODU was surprised by his speed versus Josh Jackson. So so Tech had a really good day running the football that day, but you know just. Um, and, and kind of what was lost on me was, you know, that game was 21 to 14 Hokies fairly late in the third quarter. Third quarter? Third quarter. ODU scored 28 points in the fourth, fourth quarter. They outscored Tech 28 to 7. How about that? And, and another thing that I'd forgotten about was um, just a lot of the bonehead plays, the bonehead things Tech did in the fourth quarter. Um, so let me see if I can remember them all. House Gaines was called for a, uh, a personal foul, which I thought was a was a terrible call. The play was dead, and an ODU guy was pushing him and shoving him and blocking him after the whistle, and House retaliated, so they call it on House. Uh, Chris Cunningham bumped a ref, and we got you know another name that's not there anymore. I just mentioned two guys. That we will see on Saturday. You know, yep. Cunningham bumped a ref and got a 15-yard penalty. House got called. Gerard Hewitt got called for uh, knocking a guy down after the uh, after the whistle. Uh, if if you watch the play, um, he he just shoved a, a, an offensive lineman, and there was a Tech player on the ground behind him. So the, the the ODU player goes collapsing, and just a bunch of really bad plays. They just Virginia Tech just lost it. They lost their composure, and I came out of that game thinking. Oh, that's just a bad day at the office. And no, it was a lot of what went on was a sign of things to come, as, as we've talked about before. And watching those defensive backs get beat. And, and the other thing, and, and I think we all remember this, you know, Blake LaRusa, at quarterback for, for Old Dominion, just had a career day. 494 yards. Just the dropping well, dimes. If you remember, the guys if you recall, he stride. was not their starter. Yeah. He had lost a starting job the previous year to a 17-year-old true freshman and then took it back in the second series of last year's Virginia Tech Old Dominion game. Yeah. And he's a kid who's – he's another kid who's not playing football anymore. He's in a ministry school, I believe. I believe that's yeah, right. He's, he's in, in seminary school. He um, decided to forego his final year of eligibility to, to go into ministry. Yeah, and, and there were articles after that game saying, oh, he's a legend now. Well, yeah. <laughs> he's a one-game legend, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. and just – just a really unpleasant thing to, to relive. 
And so I've seen some of the discussion on the message board like, oh, ODU is trying to make this a rivalry. It's not a rivalry. I don't know. You go back and you watch that game last year and you're 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 a little bit fired up. You you want to put you want to put ODU back in their place and you want to put Virginia Tech football back in its place. Nothing will erase that memory in the same way that nothing has erased the loss to JMU, the loss to Miami of Ohio, the loss to uh, Temple, supposedly in 1998. We think they played. We're not sure. That's a running joke. But anyway, um, nothing will erase the memories of that game, but uh, winning and winning decisively and looking good doing it will go a long way to kind of heal that wound. Chris Goldman. Tech plays you uh, Old Dominion quite a lot coming up. Mm-hmm. Both teams have beaten each other. It is was, this a rivalry? It was just two years ago that Tech beat Old Dominion thirty-eight to nothing, and uh, you know it, it's a little bit different this year because since they beat Tech last year, and because two players who played in that game for Virginia Tech last year will be playing for Old Dominion, Eric Kuma and Chris Cunningham, and they've been. Let's not leave that out in case you haven't heard captains. the news. ODU coach Bobby Wilder has named Cunningham and Kuma as two of his captains. Not the only captains. They'll be accompanied by a couple other guys. That's well, that's a little gamesmanship, I think. Yeah, it, it adds something to it. And it's also kind of helps usher Virginia Tech fans into the new era of college football where you're actually playing against a couple of your former players. So it's going to be like Eagles fans playing against the Redskins when Donovan McNabb was their quarterback, right? Or some, something like that. Well, you people know? have said that the transfer portal has created free agency in college football. Right, here you and, go. And here, um, here you go. Right. Um, now, that being said, I just – they really struggled with Norfolk State last week. And I know they got bombed by Liberty before they beat Tech last year. Um, they, they really struggled offensively. Um, they, they only threw for about 150 yards against Norfolk State. They got a new quarterback, Stone Smart. He's a Juco guy. I, I just I, – I look at their team, and I, I don't see much offensively. Um, I mean, I think Cunningham probably would have been our fourth tight end this year. And he honestly, technically, he's only ODU's third tight end. Right. Which kind of shows you how much the talent level dropped at Virginia Tech. Because Chris Cunningham once started for Virginia Tech, and now he's ODU's third tight end. Yeah. Um, you know, Kuma starts for him, and he's a solid player. But Kuma's not as good as the two receivers they lost, who both play for the Detroit Lions right now. The two receivers who tore Tech up last year sure. both play they, for the Detroit Lions. They were very Lions. impressive against right. Tech last year. Right. Um, they looked the part. So, and Kuma's a good college player, but he's not as good as either one of those guys. He's not quite as athletic as those guys. Right. Um, so, I, I don't know. Is it a rivalry? I don't think so. I, I don't see how. Rivalries are formed over time. Yeah. yeah. I'm, you... I'm not saying this is a rivalry, but I am saying that if you're a Virginia Tech fan and you don't really want to, and you don't feel a little extra fired up about this game, you should be. Yeah, I don't. I don't mean to imply that it's a rivalry. It's not likely to develop into one. What What do you think about Chris Cunningham and Eric Kuma named captains? Obviously, they know just about every player on this Tech team, and there's, I'm sure there's a lot of friendships that are still intact with a lot of those players. What do you make of Coach Wilder's decision? Uh, it's fine. I mean, I'd probably do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a little gamesmanship. It's uh, about firing your team up. Uh, I think, and and if he likes the way those guys have worked and and everything like that and how they've prepared, then and he feels like they're deserving, then yeah, I think it's fine. I do, I do. It adds something to it, I think. And uh, honestly, what, what what is college sports without stuff like that? I think I think the games have become it, sanitized. The, ga- the gamesmanship, yeah, exactly. The maybe even it's not villainous is the wrong word, but if if there was nothing interesting going on like that in college football, then college football would be one boring sport. I know, right? man. You get, you know, do do stuff like that and talk a little smack. I don't mind that stuff. Yeah, it, yeah. It, makes you know, it more you, interesting. You go back to, uh, gosh, the the eighties, I guess. I think it was Cam Young at one. But he was a sometime starter at quarterback for Virginia Tech, backup, and and he's. I, I'm not sure I've ever really been able to find this quote anymore. Anymore, but Cam anywhere, but Cam Young supposedly said that if UVA was playing against Iran, he'd probably root for Iran. Right. 
you know, that's that's the stuff. And and what was it that Bradburn did on Twitter? Uh, he got, he got a good oh, one well, off on Bryce Perkins. Some about fumb- the fumble. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Bryce Perkins. Oscar was Bradburn about, has yeah. had a couple of just fire tweets in his college career. But this particular <laughs> one was um, it, fumble the hammer. They were doing the hammer. Oh yeah, so, stone, so right? they're doing the the UVA's doing their hammer thing. And what are they doing? Break the rock. Breaking the rock. Break the rock with their hammer. You know, and and Bradburn quote tweets it and says something like, "Make sure Perkins doesn't drop the hammer." You know. <laughs> Come on, man. That's great stuff, you know. And, yeah. and, but I can just see Virginia Tech just, you know, just texting Brad Burns and saying, oh, oh, Oscar, don't do that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. No, absolutely, man. Do that sort of thing. Bobby Waller started his press conference by pointing out that Virginia Tech has lost seven of their last ten games. For Personally, <laughs> I think that's stupid for him to do. I, I think that's just silly. Um, he, why, why, um, but I'm glad he did it. It, I think it adds maybe a little something to it. Uh, and, you know, I mean, would the Florida-Tennessee rivalry have been as fun without Spurrier, right? Oh, man. You know, I mean, th- th- there's some people that, you know, technically they're the bad guy, right? Like, Ric Flair was a bad guy in wrestling. But that's why it was all, you know, he, you he really made the him role. Time, exactly, yeah, yeah exactly. And, and I'm sure if you're Bobby Wilder, it, his position, right? They beat Virginia Tech. They go 4-8 and eight last year. I believe for the most part he had to bring in new, new staff mm-hmm. because in a way – he is a little bit on the hot seat necessarily. Very much he, He's so. got to win. Yeah, yeah. And if you've got Virginia Tech coming to your place for years to come, I, why not try and make – in his case, I'm sure he's probably doing everything he can to try and make this an in-state rivalry, correct? Yeah, he tur- turned, over the ro- uh, turned over the roster. Uh, obviously, if you can manage to beat Virginia Tech for two years in a row, maybe beating Virginia Tech is what saved his job last year. I think they've had a losing record four out of the last five years. The, uh, the one year they had a good year and won the Bahamas Bowl, they had a uh, – Heineke is their quarterback who went on to become Cam Newton's backup in Carolina. For so, did he get drafted or was he a free agent? Guy? I believe he was undrafted to the Vikings and then yeah. he signed with the yeah. Panthers. But clear, clearly a good quarterback. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, so he had a really good quarterback. Other than that, ever since they made the jump to uh, FBS and joined Conference USA. Yeah, Conference USA? Yeah. I think uh, so, yeah. They, haven't, they haven't been very successful yeah. um, outside of that one year. So, if they could beat Virginia Tech for a second year in a row, you know, m- maybe he fights off the the mob, so to speak, uh, again, and keeps his job for another year. And what he did is he changed defensive coordinators in, in the off season. Uh, new scheme. They've got this position called bandit. It's kind of a hybrid defensive end, outside linebacker position. Uh, hired the East Carolina defensive coordinator, who was at ECU for one now, year. Now, don't laugh because East Carolina has a reputation for having bad defenses, but as Chris will detail, you know. In one year, they did improve. Um, he took, they took a guy, put him in that bandit role, who the previous year had been their fifth string tailback, and he became the AAC defensive player of the year. Wow. Pretty remarkable turn. It's almost like a Brendan Hill story. Right, right. It, <laughs> it really is. So this uh, defensive coordinator, and of course I forget his name, uh, because I, I didn't actually think I'd be anyway. Uh, yeah, but, but uh, uh, I think uh, it's written in his game preview. Yeah, which, yeah, we'll run which later will be out later today. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so he was he was at Jacksonville State for four years and was the FCS defensive coordinator of the year twice. Um, yeah. So it was a good hire for them. Their their defense played better against Norfolk State. How much of that is Norfolk is the fact that Norfolk State is a bad FCS program? How much of it is that their defense has improved? I, I don't know. The thing is, what, what, when you start off against a team like Norfolk State, you can tell when part of the team is bad if it's bad. I mean, when you put up less than 300 yards of offense against Norfolk State, then your offense is bad. <laughs> um <laughs> now, now, when you allow 250 yards... W- w- I'm which, sorry, I'm laughing at some of the performances Virginia Tech had against like Furman and William and Mary. Oh, I remember us being up three to nothing against Furman at halftime. At halftime and right. yes, Virginia Tech's offense was bad. I remember one year they, they beat, back in the Sean Glennon years, they beat, uh, they beat William and Mary 44 to three. But it just really... And they had, like, 250 yards of offense. Right. Yeah, right. right, right. It was a special teams thing. Yeah, well, you know, there's a reason that coaching staff eventually got relieved of their duties five years after the fact. Yes. Well, you talk about the new defensive coordinator that Old Dominion has. They also have a new offensive assistant, uh, who's Brian Steinspring, who was a longtime Virginia Tech... uh, He was a graduate assistant in 1990. He was the offensive coordinator at Virginia Tech from... Uh, 2002 to 2012, he was here till the end with Coach Beamer, a guy who's obviously known Coach Bud Foster for quite some time. 
Will, I'll start with you. He's been at Tech for the the glory days, and he is he was there for the rise of this program in the '90s. What's it going to be like having him back at Lane Stadium? What did he mean to Virginia Tech's program when he was here? You know, I haven't really had a chance to think about it. Um, I, I think you know, and and I don't have a personal relationship with Brian. I know people that know him. Uh, I know that when my mom passed away in 2008, he sent me a card and I believe that his dad passed away later and I sent him a card. So we've sent cards back and forth. Uh, I don't really know him personally. I know that, uh, um, he was part of a very successful Virginia tech recruiting staff that included him and, and Jim Cavanaugh. Both recruiting the 757. Steiny had the beach, Cav had the peninsula. And didn't Steiny also have the Lynchburg area for a while? Uh, yeah, remember they wanted to lessen his responsibility so he could focus on offensive coordinator jobs. They took him out of the 757, put him in Southside Virginia, and he recruited David Wilson, Logan Thomas. Logan Thomas yep. Yeah, uh, so it, so there were a couple of years where, oh, the Edmonds brothers, he recruited the Edmonds brothers. Wow. Cavanaugh or oh, Steiny's brothers? Steiny, Steiny. Steiny. yeah. I, I, I think... I just think that when uh, um, Ricky Bussell left after the, the 01 season? 2000. 2000. 2000. Yeah, it was, uh, remember his first game was his offensive coordinator was the Gator Bowl against Florida State. Yeah, Remember we right. threw the Stein's... ball over the middle of the field and everybody yeah, got and excited? Everybody like, oh. <laughs> uh, I just, you know, Frank made that decision to put Brian into that position. And it wasn't like Frank hadn't made decisions like that before. He made a decision to put a linebackers coach named Bud Foster up as co-defensive coordinator and then defensive coordinator. Um, I think that Brian's uh, career arc didn't go the same way. Um, if I could sum, having observed Brian Steinsbury for 10 years, if I could sum him up, it would be that he knew a, he clearly knew a lot about football and, and, and offensive and plays and schemes and all that sort of stuff. I just think he wasn't able to put it together into a, a consistently effective offense. Some of that's on Brian's shoulders. Some of that's on Frank's shoulders. Uh, I watched, you know, getting back to the whole BC thing, I watched the 2008 Virginia Tech-Boston College game that uh, they played up in Chestnut Hill and Tech lost at 28-23. Despite Virginia Tech having two defensive touchdowns and winning the turnover battle four to nothing, they lost up at Boston College 28-23. And, and I speed watched that game and Virginia Tech's offense was horrendous. Just awful. It consisted of slow handoffs to the running back for five to eight yards, punctuated with Tyrod Taylor dropping back, getting pressured, running around and chucking off target passes. So this week you've watched last year's Old Old Dominion game and the 2008 Boston College game. I'm a grumpy old man. (laughs) You really are. (laughs) Uh, So it's it's yes, it has been a tough week for me. But uh, anyway, so yes, what it means. I I don't know. uh, Brian, despite Virginia Tech's offensive struggles when, when Brian was the offensive coordinator for, for a decade, I think he's still liked in Blacksburg. That was never the issue. People like Brian, you know, and uh, uh, I don't know, but it, it really, he's the guy to ask, what do you think? He's been back, right? Hasn't he been, has he been back in Lane Stadium before? I do not know. I, Have I, we played JMU? Yeah. He, he, uh, was, at, uh, he, he was at Maryland. He was at Maryland for a with while. With Mike London. Yeah. Uh, or when, uh, Mike, when Mike Glenn was the associate head coach, he was there. Yeah, uh, and then he was at JMU. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I think Steiny was an average offensive coordinator who turned into a bad offensive coordinator after the 2005 staff changes. Yeah. When Tech lost Danny Pierman because he quote you know couldn't, couldn't recruit. recruit. <laughs> and by the way, he's now on Clemson staff. Well. Uh, uh, all right. So they ran off Pierman after 2005 and replaced him. Tony Ball left. Uh, who else? Kevin Rogers left. Yes. So and then so you bring in guys. All right, they brought in O'Kane as quarterbacks coach out of retirement. Like he'd literally been calling Virginia Tech games as a color analyst the year before. Um, you bring in Kurt Newsom, who for ninety percent of his career had been a defensive coach to coach the offensive line, and then and then Kevin Sherman, his other jobs have been Wake Forest and Pitt. And just didn't – I thought we downgraded a coaching staff around Steiny yeah. after that 2005 season, and he went from being average to bad as a result. It's – I'm not I, – I have bear no ill will towards him at all because yeah. it's not his fault that he uh, – was not put in the best position to succeed. Like, yeah. like if you traded Malcolm and I right now, I couldn't do his job and he couldn't do my job, and that would be your fault, not 
not, not, not our fault, right? <laughs> it, it's, it's, just not, it's not a program that was really set up to be successful offensively, you know, and, and for all the things Frank did well, I, I think most reasonable Tech fans will admit that offense was never really his forte. You know, they had some good players and good teams throughout the years, but uh, in general, they ran a much – more polished operation defensively and special teams wise than they did offense. No, now let me let me reel off some names for you though. All right. Vince Hall, D'Angelo Hall, James Anderson. Steiny recruits. Terrell Edmonds, Trey Edmonds, Tremaine, Tremaine Edmonds. I don't think technically Tremaine, but maybe I, I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, but but you know Tremaine here or Tremaine came to Tech because of his brothers, of course, who Steiny had recruited. Uh, that guy just brought in a ton of talent to the Virginia Tech program, most of which ended up playing for Bud Foster, quite frankly. I mean, Bud had a lot of good players in this program that Steiny recruited. Well, Steiny recruited Chris Clifton. He played offense. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, kidding. right. I'm, I'm trying to be funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure it'll be neat before the game to see him you know, give a big hug to Bud Foster and Charlie Wiles, and I'm yeah. sure the video board will probably show him, and a, a warm round of applause will be given. I'm assuming he's on the field. For all I know, he might be in the booth. I really have no idea. Uh, I, don't, okay. I, don't, I don't think he's in the booth. I wouldn't think a tight end. What is what is there, a tight end coach? Okay. Yeah. yeah, he'll probably be on the. Field. He'll probably be on the field. And you're listening to the Tech Sideline Podcast. We're recording on a Wednesday, September the 4th. We're getting ready for Virginia Tech in Old Dominion. We're going to take a timeout, and when we come back, we are going to uh, take a look at what Virginia Tech needs to do well on Saturday, what they took away from the Boston College game, hope to apply that against Old Dominion, and we'll get predictions and uh, close out the podcast. This is the Tech Sideline Podcast presented by the Fisher Law Firm. So did you think the Steiny discussion was going to be that? Oh. No, just leave. Just leave the. Uh... Okay, we're back. Are okay, we back? are we back to streaming live? Yeah, you. Are you, are you sure? Oh. show show me Facebook. There you go. Okay. All right, ready? Yes. Three, two, one. And our thanks to the Fisher Law Firm for being the title sponsor of the Tech Sideline podcast. All that Jonathan Fisher and his team at the Fisher Law Firm do for us here at Tech Sideline. We've got Malcolm, yes, he's related to Stewart behind the scenes. Will Stewart, Chris Coleman. My name is Evan Hughes. Glad you are with us on the Tech Sideline podcast. Chris has something funny to Dick share. Bando comments on Facebook. Met my first and third wife at Center Street Tailgates. Wow. <laughs> Wow, Nick. Where'd you meet your second? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you're doing something wrong there, Nick, but it's not just Center Street. Uh, anyway. I'm glad we got continue. to start the podcast off talking about Center Street. Definitely was not expecting that, but I'm glad we definitely talked uh, about good that. Good stuff, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to miss it when Malcolm moves away from Center Street. And I don't have a tailgate parking spot over there anymore. Well, guys, we've talked about um, the running back situation. We've talked about the ties to Old Dominion and Virginia Tech coming into this game. Now it's time to break it down, X's and O's. And, Chris, you kind of already have touched on Old Dominion. Certainly last year, a prime example, they got crushed by Liberty and then beat Virginia Tech the next week. Not reading too much in, but only beating Norfolk State 24-21. Juco quarterback and Stone Smart, who was 17 of 23 through the air, mm -hmm. ran for 50 yards. Let's start with Old Dominion. What can Virginia Tech expect? from this ODU team X's and O's wise? Well, I'm sure though, X's and O's wise, I don't know. I, I didn't watch I didn't watch the Norfolk State game. <laughs> I mean, I've been busy covering Virginia Tech. Come on, then. man. I watched two extra games uh, this but, week. But, but, I, but I, I really don't know. I, uh, I know defensively they're going to get a much different look than they got last year. Uh, how are they going to line up that bandit? Um, I expect Virginia Tech will go back and watch a lot of East Carolina film from last year, maybe even, even some Jacksonville State. Maybe it would be a little beneficial if East Carolina hadn't canceled the game last year and, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, Tech could uh, have some film of their own players against this guy's scheme. Um, but I just – I don't think lightning strikes twice. I mean, Old Dominion was not good last year. They hammered Tech for whatever reason. Uh I just don't see their offense doing much. I mean, when you when you struggle to move the ball against Norfolk State, um, I, just, I don't feel like you should do very much against Virginia Tech. Well, let me ask you this. What are some things you're hoping Virginia Tech will improve on in week two compared to week one against Boston College? Well, running the football, clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I thought the passing game was fine. You know, Ryan made a few poor throws that resulted in interceptions, but in general the passing game was, was pretty good for Virginia Tech. Um, so – Unlike last week, I did do the roster cards before this show. 
And, you know, ODU started 13 seniors last year, uh, seniors and redshirt seniors. And some of those guys were grown men who are in NFL camps. Um, yeah, they had two guys drafted. Virginia Tech had zero players Old drafted. Dominion had the most yeah. players drafted out of any team in the state of Virginia last year. <laughs> right. <laughs> A little trivia there. Um, so it, it was just – they were part of this weird – string of senior laden teams that Virginia Tech ran into last year. Now this year ODU's got four seniors playing for him. And one of those is Eric Kuma. Um, so they, they've lost, man, and making up the roster cards, I think defensively there's only two names back for them from last year. And one of those guys has been moved. That's good. For, yes. They couldn't stop anybody last year. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's good for them. I mean, you know, I, I, I looked at our game preview last year. I, I picked Virginia Tech to win that game 48 to 10. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and the spread this year is the same as it was last year, 28 points. Um, and so I just uh, – this this game should not be competitive. Uh, I think the biggest thing I'm looking for is an improved run offense, and um, I don't really know what I'm looking for defensively. You know, a, a defensive tackle play probably. I'm I think I think Old Dominion they're better defensively. That's my gut feel. Although you can't really tell from a Norfolk State game, so I don't really know what I expect from a offensive production standpoint. Um, I don't necessarily think Tech's going to put up 600 yards like they did last year, but they probably should have scored more points. Well, they definitely should have scored more points last year, considering they put up 600 yards. Yeah, but they they were able to move the football. I expect them to be more efficient with their scoring opportunities, or at least I hope they are. Um, I. Again, it shouldn't be a difficult game for Tech to win, but you never truly know, especially when the other team turns over so much personnel. You know, sometimes you read these Athlon magazines in the summer and you're like, oh, oh, that, that team was bad de on defense last year, but they got eight starters returning. That might not be a good thing. Maybe you need maybe you need to completely turn over your personnel and get Very new true. players, and that's kind of what Old Dominion did to a certain extent, and I think that was the right move, personally. All right, so before I ask you guys for predictions, I like doing this when we lead up to games. I did this last week. I'll do it again. When we do the podcast on Monday, what's the one thing we talk about in a Virginia Tech win on Monday? If they win, what's what, what, what will we be discussing on Monday that Tech did well? Mm, I really hope that we are talking about an improved pass rush from the defensive lineman. Or I'm actually not picky. If Bud wants to throw some uh, blitzes into the mix that create pressure on the quarterback, I'll enjoy watching that too. That's what I'd like to be talking about from Virginia Tech win. Chris, yeah, what do you want to be hoping to talk about? I would about? definitely, it would be nice if uh, – we could talk about an improved pass rush from the front four, but I don't, I don't see a natural pass rusher on this on this mm -hmm. team, so I don't think that's going to happen. I'm not saying none of our defensive – we'll get a sack at any point this year. I'm just saying I think the tackles not going to be a time, whole bunch. I think the tackles over time will, will pop off some plays. And, right. You know, right. And the, I think they, they're young, so they need to work on their consistency. They seem like they have more twitch than yeah, the Yeah, there, there was some instance. penetration there. I, I would like to get Jalen Griffin more playing time. I think he's the most athletic of Virginia Tech's defensive end, my personal opinion. Yeah. I think we'll, talk, we'll be talking about – Oh, so that's what Kashawn King can do in the open field. Yeah, that was my other option yeah. was Kashawn King. Yep. Now, time for predictions. I think I know both of where you guys are going, but uh, give me a ballpark. What's the final score going to be? So I'm going to resurrect last year's 48-10 to 10 prediction. That's what I want to see this year. I, I forgot what I picked in, in the preview. Oh, it was uh, very similar. You and Yeah, I it was pretty similar. I, I think after I wrote it that I, I, I might have overshot a little bit. I'll, I'll go 41-10. to 10. 41 time. Okay, there you go. Will and Chris both have Virginia Tech beating Old Dominion. And now it's time to turn it over to Malcolm. Uh, yes, he's related to Stuart behind the scenes. Uh, we've got some Center Street comments on there. So what else? What uh, what other comments do we have, Malcolm? Come on, dead air, man. you got to fill the dead air. Sorry. Why is Terrius Wheatley not in the mix at running back? He was impressive Question. in the few carries. Yeah, he, he was impressive in the why, carries. Why is Terrius Wheatley not in the mix at running back? Yeah, because he spent the offseason hurt. He had shoulder surgery, missed all of spring practice. Uh, you know, the reason he was getting those end rounds last year instead of being used as a traditional tailback is because he hurt that shoulder during the season. And and they wanted they just they didn't want to put too much on his shoulder, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, literally, it, literally. Um, so he's one of those guys, like I said, he needed to stay healthy early in his career so we could pack on the required muscle mass in the upper body. And unfortunately he has not now he's going to have to get himself in there probably by default start, starting this weekend. Um, he's still only about 190 pounds or thereabouts. Uh, 
see again, he's got to stay healthy this off season. But uh, you know, I'm not I'm not expecting. That. I think he's got good natural ability, but yeah. I thought he showed good speed last I, year. I thought he showed good speed. I think he's got a good good cut, good agility. But he's just one of those guys who, and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of guys like this throughout college football that the success of their career comes down to how healthy they stay early in their career uh, yeah. when they're hitting the weight room and starting to physically mature. Well, Can that's, they that's put, why redshirting the freshman is so important. So important. And they did redshirt him to be fair, but it right. was, you know, and he did put on weight. I think he put on 10 or 15 pounds in that redshirt year, but he was still only, you know, 190, 1 to 195 last year. I mean, he started for, at a very low, low weight. So, so that 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 really set him back. That that shoulder surgery, I think. It, that, those shoulder surgeries, if they're, if they're bad ones, they can really set back your career. Anything else, Malcolm? Uh, when was the last time we had a defensive touchdown, and do you think we'll have one this Saturday? Defensive when was the last touchdown. time we had a defensive touchdown, and will there be one Saturday? <laughs> I'd never pick a defensive touchdown, so uh, I'm going to say no. Wow. Um, uh, there were not many special teams and defensive touchdowns. Well, we've had a special teams touchdown against Florida State. Against we Florida had one State. against UVA. Dylan Rivers got a pick against Cincinnati. I don't think he returned it for a touchdown, though. I think he were set up a short field or something Last like that. defensive touchdown. That's a good question. Uh, Quillen could have had one, but he fell down against North Carolina. Reggie could have had one against Notre Dame, but he fell down. He fell down. Oh, gosh. Man. That's ugh. Yeah, I've watched that recently too. We might have to bring that. <laughs> we need to get you to watch like not uh, against Georgia Tech, not against Pitt. Watch something uh, happy. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe. I, we'll, how about this? Uh, we'll, we'll look that up and we'll bring it up on Monday. If you say so, I'm sure you're going to have to remember this. I will remember <laughs> this. I will. He's a professional. He'll, yes. he'll do a good job. <laughs> Anything else, Malcolm? Or that that about it? Uh, you know, I don't drink beer. So I don't know the legality of this question. I know we've still got stick it in cases sitting over there. <laughs> Is that visible on the? No. Okay. <laughs> but I see it. But I know people still want to get it, but we it's not distributed yet. Uh, question so about it's on the way. Okay. So yes, we do need to do a stick it in ale update. I'm going to speak with uh, someone at Beltway today who's going to let me know. But here's what I do know. Um, like I said the other day, Blue Ridge beverage out of Salem is is distributing it in this area um, I don't know if it's going to be in stores uh, I hope it will be I, I know it's going to be in champs that's the only yes, thing I we, know. so let, so let me say this about it uh, the, the answer to that question is keep an eye on the site we will once we get it published a list of a list of places where you can find it either for carry out or for uh, on tap so just uh, stay tuned and we'll let you know Stick it in ale. It's I think I saw Chris share something on Facebook of the large cases on the move from Northern Virginia about a yeah. week ago. That's oh, a, yeah? That was a lot yeah. of uh, – yeah. so, all right. Well, if that's it for behind the scenes, that's going to wrap things up here for the preview of Old Dominion and Virginia Tech, our podcast on Wednesday, September the 4th, as I always do to close the show. Chris, Will, I'm sure it's going to be a normal week, but uh, what's coming up on TSL? have a pro game preview later today. I uh, have a Brandon Patterson look back on the BC game. Uh, I think Jake is sending us a women's soccer article. They're yep. off to a 4 0 start. 23rd and, um, in the country. We'll have a Friday QA later in the week. Lots of stuff. Yeah. Quick soccer update. Both teams are in the top 25 right now. Men's, men's soccer is number 10 in the, the country. Yeah. So, you know, one, one feature that Chris did this week for the first time that we're going to be doing continuously uh, this year is we have a subscription there, Pro Football Focus, mm -hmm. which branched out into college football analysis about four or five years ago. So it's it's a PFF is a, a way for you to look up all kinds of stats on players. You can find out how many snaps a player played and somebody analyzes film and grades every single player that played in a game. So what we did with it this week was we ran an article uh, based on PFF grades talking about who played well on the defense, mm -hmm. uh, highlighting defensive tackle play, which was very encouraging mm -hmm. uh, from a, from a PFF grade standpoint. They don't publish how they grade players. Frankly, I don't want them to. I assume they've got guys that know what they're doing, you know, and uh, 
So that's a new feature that we're doing this year, and that's a subscriber feature. Really great stuff. Fantastic. Looking forward to another great week on TexasIDline.com. Great content as always. And for us on the podcast, we'll be back Monday morning around 10 a.m. breaking down Virginia Tech and Old Dominion. That's going to do it for this week's show. For Malcolm, yes, he's related to Stuart behind the scenes producing. Our managing editor, Chris Coleman, our founder, and our head honcho, Will Stewart. My name is Evan Hughes saying so long. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you Monday right back here on the Tech Sideline Podcast.